I'm sorry, the weather is so foul. <coughs> I'm sure many of you come with your personal problems. And I hope by these talks they will be solved. But they can only be solved if we apply self-choiceless awareness and a quality of religious wholeness. I mean, we mean by religion, not beliefs, dogmas, rituals, and the vast network of superstition, but religion in the deep sense of that word, which only comes into being when there is this self-awareness and meditation. And that's what we are going to talk about during these four talks, yes. And two question and answers, as it been explained. To go into this matter rather deeply, not only to be aware naturally and easily with our own particular problems, which are related with the wo problems of the world, because we human beings are more or less alike throughout the world, psychologically. You may have different colour, different culture, different habits and customs. But in spite of that, all human beings go through a great deal of travail, great deal of sorrow, great anxieties, loneliness, despairs, dis depressions. Not being able to solve them, <coughs> they seek salvation through somebody else, through various forms of beliefs, dogmas and acceptance of authorities. So, when we are discussing, talking over together these problems, if we merely confine ourselves to our own particular little problem, then that self-centred activity only makes it more narrow more limited and therefore more it becomes more of a prison. Whereas if we could during these talks and dialogues or question and answers, if we could relate ourselves to the whole of humankind, the whole of humanity. We are part of that humanity. Over in the East they suffer just as much as you do. They have their sorrows, their unhappiness, their utter loneliness, 
a sense of negligence by the society. There is no security, no certainty. They are confused as much as we are here. So we are essentially, deeply, psychologically part of that humanity. I think this must be understood really not merely verbally or intellectually or through reason, but one has to feel this. Not, it is not a sentiment, sentiment or romantic idea, but act, an actuality, that we are part of this whole of humankind, and therefore we have a tremendous responsibility. And to bring about a unity among all our, our other human beings, it's only religion can do this, bring us all together, not politics. Not science, not some new philosophy or some expensive economy or various organizations, political, religious, none of them are going to bring us together as a whole. I think this one has to realize very deeply that no organization, religious, political, economic, or the various forms of United Nations organizations will bring man together. It's only religion, in the deep sense of that word, can bring us all together. Religion, I mean by, we mean by that word, not all that is going on in the world, the various superstitions, the make-belief, the hierarchical setup, the dogmas, the rituals, the beliefs. Religion is far beyond all that. It's a way of living. Daily. And if we could think over together, think together, not about something, but have the capacity to be able to look here and think together. Could we, during this talk, do that? Not that we must agree with each other or accept each other's opinions or judgments, but rather putting aside our own particular point of view, our own experience, our own conclusions, if we can, set those aside and have the capacity to think together, not about something which is fairly easy, but to be able to see the same thing together, to hear the same meaning, the significance, the depth of a world, to hear the same song, not interpreted according to your like and dislike, but to hear it together. Because I think it's very important to be able to think together. Not 
as a group having the same thought, the same point of view, the same outlook. But having set aside one's own particular idiosyncrasies, habits of thought, come together in thought. Say, for instance, we can think together about belief. We can argue for it or against it. We can see how important belief is to have some kind of psychological security. And being desirous of that security, we will believe in anything. This is happening in the world. Believe in the most ridiculous nonsense, both economically, religiously, and in every way. So we can think about a belief together, agreeing or disagreeing. But we are trying something else, which is not thinking about something, but thinking itself together. I wonder if I am making myself clear. No people, apparently, no two people, apparently, are capable of thinking together, unless there is some catastrophe, unless there is some great sorrow, a crisis, then people come together and think together about a war and so on. It is always thinking together about something. Right? But we are trying something which is to think together. which is only possible if we, for the moment, forget ourselves, our own problems, our own inclinations, our intellectual capacities and so on, so on, and meet each other. That requires a certain sense of attention, a certain sense of awareness, that each one of us are together in the quality of thinking. I don't know how to express it more than that. Could we do that? About, the, about all our problems. We can think together about our problems. But to have the capacity to think at the same level, with the same intensity, not about something, but the feeling of thinking together. I wonder. If we could do that, we can go together into many things. That means a certain quality of freedom, a certain sense of detachment, not forced, compelled, driven, but the freedom from our own backyard, and then meet together. Because it becomes very important, this becomes very important 
when we want to create a good society. The philosophers have talked about it, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Hindus and the Chinese have talked about have, bringing about a good society that is in the future. Sometime in the future we will create a good society according to an ideal, a pattern, a certain, set, certain senses, sense of ideals and so on. And apparently, throughout the world, a good society has never come into being. There are good people, maybe. It's becoming more and more difficult to be good in this world. And we're always looking to the future to bring about this good society. Good in the sense where people can live on this earth without wars, peacefully, without slaughtering each other, without competition, in a sense of great freedom, and so on. We are not defining what is good for the moment. Definition of the good doesn't make one good. So can we together think the absolute need of a good society? The, the society is what you are, what we are. Society doesn't come into being mysteriously. It's not created by God. Man has created this society with all the wars and all that's going on. We don't have to go into all the horrible details of it. And that society is what we are, what he, each human being is. That's fairly obvious. It is. We create this society with all its divisions, with its conflicts, with its terror, with its inequality, and so on, so on, so on. Because in ourselves we are that, which is in our relationship with each other, we are that. We may be fairly tolerant, fairly affectionate in private relationship, even that's rather doubtful. But with regard to the rest of the human beings, we are not, which is again fairly obvious when you read the newspapers, magazines and actually see what's going on. So good society can only be come into being, not in the future but now, when we human beings have established right relationship between ourselves. Is that possible? Not in some future date, but actually in the present, in our daily life, could we bring about a relationship that is essentially Good. Good be without domination, without personal interest, without personal vanity, ambition and so on. So that there is an, a relationship between, between each other which is based essentially on, if I may use the word, and I hope you won't mind, love. Is that possible?
can we as human beings living in this terrible world which we have created could we bring about a radical change in ourselves that's the whole point some philosophers and others have said human conditioning is impossible radical to change you can modify it you can polish it refine it but the basic quality of of conditioning you cannot alter it there are great many people who think that the existential sense so on so on so on. why do we accept such condition you following a hope what we talk why do we accept our conditioning which has brought about this really mad world insane world where we want peace and we are supplying armaments where we want peace and we are nationalistically economically socially dividing each other we want peace and all religions such making us separate as they are the organizations there's such vast contradiction out there as well as in ourselves i wonder if one is aware of all this in ourselves not what is happening out there most of us know what is happening out there you don't have to be very clever to find out just observe and that confusion out there is partly responsible for our, our own conditioning we are asking is it possible to bring about in our souls a radical transformation of this because only then we can have a good society but we won't hurt each other both psychologically as well as physically when one asks this question of our souls what is our deep response to that question one is conditioned not only is an englishman or a german or french canadian or so on but also one is conditioned by various forms of desires beliefs pleasures and conflict psychological conflict all that contributes to this conditioning and more we'll go into it and we are asking ourselves thinking together because we are thinking together i hope can this <coughs> conditioning can this human prism with its griefs loneliness anxieties personal assertions personal demands fulfillments and all that that's our condition that's our <coughs> consciousness and our consciousness is its content <coughs> and we are say we are asking can that whole structure be transformed 
otherwise we will never have peace in this world. There will be perhaps little modifications, but man will be fighting, quarrelling, <coughs> perpetually in conflict within himself and, <coughs> and outwardly. So that is our question. Can we think together with regard to this? Then the question arises, what is one to do when he is aware that one is conditioned, knows, conscious? This conditioning has come into being by one's own desires. Self-centred activities. Through lack of right relationship with each other. One's own sense of loneliness. The one may have live among great many people have <coughs> intimate relationship. But there is always this sense of empty world within oneself. All that is our conditioning, intellectual, psychological, emotional, and also physical, naturally. Now can this be totally be transformed? That I feel is the real revolution. In that there is no violence. Now can we do it together? Or if you do it, if you understand the conditioning and resolve that conditioning, and another is Condition will will the man who is conditioned listen to another? You are understand my. Perhaps you are con- unconditioned. Will I listen to you? And what will make me listen? What pressure? What influence? What reward? What will make me listen to you with my heart, with my mind, with my whole being? Because if one can listen so completely, perhaps the solution is there. But we can apparently we don't seem to listen. So we're asking, what will make a human being, knowing his conditioning, most of us do, if we are at all intelligently aware, what will make us change? Please put this question to ourselves, each one of us. Find out what will make us, each one of us, bring about a change, a a freedom from this conditioning. Not to jump into another conditioning. It's like leaving Catholicism and becoming a Buddhist. It is the same pattern. So what will make one, each one of us, who um, one is quite sure is desirous of bringing about a good society, 
What will make him change? Change has been promised through reward. Heaven, a new kind of carrot, a new ideology, new community, new set of groups, new gurus, a reward, or a punishment. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell. So our whole thinking is based on this principle of reward and punishment. I'll do this if I can get something out of it. But that kind of attitude or the way of thinking doesn't bring about a radical change. And that change is absolutely necessary. I'm sure we are all aware of it. So what shall we do? Some of you have listened to the speaker for a number of years. I wonder why. And having listened, it becomes a, a new kind of mantra. You know what that word is? It's a Sanskrit word, meaning in its true meaning is not to be self centered and ponder over not about not becoming. The meaning of that is that. Mantra means that. Abolish self centeredness. And ponder, meditate, look at yourself so that you don't become something. That is the real meaning of that world, which has been ruined by all the transcendental meditation nonsense. So some of you have listened for many years. And do we listen and therefore bring about a change, or you've got used to the words and just carry on? So we are asking, what will make man, a human being, who has lived for so many million years, carrying on the same old pattern, inherited the same instincts, self-preservation, fear, security, sense of self-concern which brings about great isolation. What will make that man change? A new God, a new form of entertainment, new religious football, new kind of circus with all the, you know, all that stuff. What will make us change? Sorrow, apparently, has not changed man, because we have suffered a great deal, not only individually but collectively, as a whole of mankind we have suffered an enormous amount – wars, disease, pain, death. We have suffered enormously. 
and that apparently sorrow has not changed us. No fear. That hasn't changed us. Because our mind is pursuing constantly, seeking out pleasure. And that even that pleasure hasn't is the same pleasure in different forms that hasn't changed us. So what will make us change? We don't seem to be able to do anything voluntarily. We will do things under pressure. If there was no pressure, no sense of reward or punishment, because reward and punishment are too silly to even think about it. If there was no sense of future. I don't know if you've gone into that whole question of future, that maybe our deception psychologically will go into that presently. If you abandon all those, then what is the quality of the mind that faces absolutely the present? You understand my question? Are we communicating with each other? Please say yes or no. I don't know where we are. <laughs> Hope I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> if, I, if one realizes that one is in a prison, that prison created by oneself, oneself being the result of the past, parents, grandparents, so on, so on, inherited, acquired, imposed. That's our psychological prison in which we live. And naturally, the instinct, ins- natural instinct is to break through that prison. Now, do, does one realize, not as an idea, not as a concept, but as an actuality? psychologically a fact. When one faces that fact, why is it even then (coughs) there is no possibility of change? (coughs) You understand my This has been a problem, probably for all serious people, for all people who are concerned with what the human tragedy, the human misery, and asking themselves, why don't we all bring about a sense of clarity in ourselves, a sense of freedom, a sense of being essentially good. I don't know if you have not noticed the intellectuals, the literary people, the writers and the so-called leaders of the world are never, are not talking about bringing about good society, they give it up. They don't, they, 
we were talking the other day with some other people, and they said, what nonsense that is. That's old-fashioned. Throw it out. There is no such thing as a good society anymore. This is Victorian, stupid, nonsensical. We have to accept things as they are and live with them. And probably with most of us it's like that. So for you and I, as two friends, talking over this, what shall we do? Authority of another doesn't change, doesn't bring about this change, right? If I accept you as my authority, because I want to bring about a revolution in myself, and so perhaps bring about a good society, the very idea of the, uh, my following you as you are instructing you, me, that ends good society. I wonder if you see that. I am not good because you tell me to be good. Or I accept you as the supreme authority of, over righteousness, and I follow you. The very acceptance of authority and obedience is the very destruction of good society. Isn't that so? I wonder if you see this. Hmm? Can we? Need we go into further into this matter? If I have a guru, thank God I haven't got one. If I have a guru and I followed him, what have I done to myself? What have I done in the world? Nothing. He tells me some nonsense, how to meditate this or that, and I'll get marvellous experience or levitate on all the rest of nonsense. And my intention is to bring about a good society where we can, we can be happy, where, where there is a sense of affection, a relationship, so that there is no barrier. That's my longing. I go to you as my guru, and what have I done? I've destroyed the very thing that I wanted. Because Authority, <coughs> apart from law and all the rest of that, psychological authority is divisive, is in its very nature separative. You up there and I down below. And so you are always progressing higher and higher, and I'm also progressing higher and higher. We never meet. <laughs> this is what you laugh, I know. But actually, this is what we are doing. So, can I, can I realize authority with its implication of organization will never free me? Authority gives one a sense of security. I don't know, I am confused. You know, perhaps, at least I think you know. That's good enough for me. I invest my energy and my demand for security in you, in what you are talking about. And we create an organization around that, and that very organization becomes the prison. I don't know if you know all this. That's why one should not belong to any spiritual organization, however promising, however <coughs> enticing, however romantic. 
Can we even accept, see that together? You understand my question? See it together, to be a fact. And therefore, when we see that together, it's finished. Seeing that the very nature of authority, with its organization, religious and otherwise, <coughs> is separative and obedience, setting up the hierarchical system, which is what is happening in the world and therefore which is part of the very destructive nature of the world, seeing the truth of that, throw it out. Can we do that? So that none of us I'm sorry. So that none of us belong to any organized spiritual organizations. That in religious organizations, Catholic Protestant, Hindu, Buddhist, none. By belonging to something, we feel secure. Right? Obviously. But belonging to something invariably brings about insecurity, because in itself it is separative. You have your guru, your authority, your Catholic person, and somebody else is something else. So they never meet. The all organized religion says we are all working together for truth. So can we listen to each other to this fact? Finish from our thinking all sense of acceptance of authority, psychological authority, and therefore all the organizations created around it. Then what happens? Have I dropped authority because you have said so? And I see the destructive nature of these so called organizations. And do I see it as a fact and therefore with intelligence, or just vaguely accept it? I don't know if you are following this. If, I, if one sees the fact, the very perception of that fact is intelligence. And in that intelligence there is security. Not in some superstitious nonsense. I wonder if you are we meeting each other? I'm a bit lost. Would you tell me are we meeting each other? Yes. No, not verbally, please. That's very easy because we're all speaking English or French or whatever it is. Intellectually, verbally, is not meeting together. It is when you see the fact together. Now, can we? So we are asking: Can we look at the fact of our condition? Not the idea of our conditioning, the fact that we are British, German, American, Russian, or Hindu or Eastern, whatever it is, that's one thing. Conditioning brought about through economic reasons, climate, climate food, clothes and so on physical, but also there is a great deal of psychological conditioning. Can we look at that as fact? 
like fear. Can we look at that? Or if you can't for the moment, can we look at the hurts that we have received, the wounds, the psychological wounds that we have treasured, the wounds that we have received from childhood? Look at it, not analyse it. The psychotherapists – sorry, I hope there aren't any here – the psychotherapists go back investigate into the past, that is, seek the cause of the wounds that one has received, investigating, analysing the whole movement of the past, that is generally called analysis, psychotherapies. Now, discovering the cause, does that help? And you have taken a lot of time, years perhaps, you know, it's a game that you all, we all play, because we never want to face the fact, but let's investigate what, how the fact has come into being. I don't know if you are following all this. So you are expending a great deal of energy and probably a great deal of money into professional investigation into the past or your own investigation, if you are capable of it. And we are seeing such forms of analysis is not only Separately, because the analyzer thinks he is different from the thing he is analyzing. Right? You are following all this? <laughs> so, and he maintains this division through analysis, whereas the obvious fact is the analyzer is the analyzed. I wonder if you see that. The moment one recognises that the analyzer is the analysed, because when you are angry, you are not ana- you are that. I won't, you understand? What is this puzzle that the observer is the observed? When there is that actual reality of that, then analysis has no meaning. There is only pure observation of the fact which is happening now. I wonder if you see this. Because it may be rather difficult, because most of us are so conditioned to the analytical process, self-examination, introspective investigation. We are so accustomed to that, we are so conditioned by it, that perhaps <coughs> if something new is said, you instantly reject or you withdraw. So please invest, look at it. So we are saying, is it possible to look at the fact as it is happening now, anger, jealousy, violence, pleasure, fear, whatever it is, to look at it, not analyse it, just to look at it. And in that very observation is the observer merely observing the fact as something separate from himself, or he is the fact. You're, I wonder if you get this. Have we, am I making myself clear? 
You understand the distinction? Most of us are conditioned to the idea the observer is different from the thing observed. I have been greedy. I have been violence, violent. So at the moment of violence there is no division. It's only later on thought picks it up and separates itself from the fact. So <coughs> the observer is the past looking at actually what is happening now. I wonder if you get all this. So can you look at the fact you are angry, misery, loneliness, whatever it is, look at that fact without the observer saying, I am separate and looking at it differently. You understand? Or does he recognise the fact is himself? There is no division between the fact and himself. The fact is himself. I wonder if and therefore what takes place when that actuality takes place? You and Sarah, huh? Look, I've my mind has been conditioned to look at the fact that is loneliness, let's take that. Or no, we began with being hurt from childhood. Look, let's look at it. <coughs> I've been <coughs> accustomed, used to thinking that I am different from the hurt. Right? And therefore my action towards that hurt is either suppression, avoidance, or building around my hurt so um, a resistance so that I don't get hurt anymore. Therefore, that hurt is making me more and more isolated, more and more afraid. So this division has taken place because I think I am different from the hurt. Right? You are following on that? But the hurt is me. The me is the image that I have created about myself, which is hurt. <coughs> right? I wonder if you see all this. May I go on? You are following all this? So, I have created an image through education, through my family, through society, <coughs> through all the religious ideas of soul, separateness, individual, all that, I've created an image about myself. And you tread on that image, I get wounded. Then I say, that hurt is not me, I must do something about that hurt. So I maintain the division between the hurt and myself. But the fact is, the image is me, which has been hurt, right? So can I look at that fact? Look at the fact, the image is myself, and as long as I have the image about myself, somebody is going to tread on it. That's a fact. Can, I, can the mind be free of the image? Because I, one realises, as long as that image exists, you are going to do something to it, put a pin into it, and therefore there will be hurt, <coughs> with the result of isolation, fear, resistance, building a wall around myself, all that takes place when there is the division between the <coughs> observer and the observed, which is the hurt. Right? This is too 
This is not intellectual, please. This is just ordinary observing oneself, which we began by saying self-awareness. So, what takes place then when the observer is the observed, you understand? The actuality of it, not the idea of it. Then what takes place? I have been hurt from childhood, through school, through parents, through other f- boys and girls. You know, I have been hurt, wounded psychologically. And I carried that hurt throughout my life, hidden, anxious, frightened. And I know the result of all that. And now I face my... I see that hurt exists as long as the image which I have created, which has been brought about together, as long as that exists, there will be hurt. That image is me. Can I look at that fact? Not as an idea looking at it, but the actual fact that the image is hurt, the image is me. Right? Could we come together in that one point at least, think together? Then what takes place? Before I try. The observer tried to do something about it. Here the observer is absent, therefore he can't do anything about it. You get it? You understand what has taken place? Before the observer exerted himself in suppressing it, controlling it, not to be hurt, isolating himself, resisting and all the rest of it making a tremendous effort. But whereas when the when when the fact is the observer is the observed, then what takes place? Please, do you want me to tell you? Then we are nowhere, then I'll tell you that no meaning. But if we could if we have come together, that's what I think together and come to this point, then you will discover for yourself that as long as you make an effort, there is the division. Right? So, pure obse- in pure observation there is no effort. And therefore, the thing which has been put together as the image, begins to dissolve. Are you with? That's the whole point. We began by saying self-awareness and the meditative quality in that awareness brings about a religious sense of unity. And human beings need this enormous sense of unity, which cannot be found through nationalities, through all the rest of that business. So can we, as human beings, after listening perhaps an hour, I don't know, Yes, Pichu. See at least one fact together. And seeing that fact together, resolve it completely. So that we as human beings are never hurt psychologically. In that 
thinking together implies that we both of us see the same thing at the same time, at the same level, which means love. You follow, sir? I think that's enough this morning, for, isn't it? We meet again tomorrow morning.